as much as I hate to say, I didn't really have to do anything to turn it into a business on that end. It kind of just turned itself into a business. My name is Clay Kua. I own and operate Oakmont Design. I have been operating since 2014, uh, but I've only had my sawmill now for about a year. I purchased the sawmill because of lumber prices, and I noticed that there was uh, potential for a big ROI of producing my own lumber. So when I started Oakmont Design, I believe in 2014, uh, it was more of trying to make some beer money when I was in school. And uh, at the time, I think I was a sophomore, maybe a junior. And I had some tools laid around and a couple things kind of for my grandfather. And I had some family members that wanted some certain odds and ends. I think my first piece I ever built was like a coffee table. I was actually going to an art school here in Columbus and working on my BFA for industrial design. So I was able to couple that with my hand skills and put those two together. And I didn't know that was going to happen until a couple of years into it. And I think by the time I graduated is when I really formed Oakmond. My project slowly got bigger and bigger. So I uh, added a little bit of fabricating and welding into it. It was kind of my arsenal. And I build high-end custom furniture and they're one-off pieces. So I don't recreate or I don't have like a catalog. Every piece is specifically designed and created for the client or the end user. When I took my hand skills and then also the computer skills, like maybe building a CAD rendering of a piece of uh, furniture and kind of marrying those two together, the outcome was a really unique piece of furniture. And when I first started, there were definitely rudimentary pieces. I was making a lot of charcuterie boards, but that was kind of the building block of Oakmond and where I got my first money to purchase my newer machines and uh, was able to kind of build my shop up. That took a lot of years. I, I want to say I didn't get real serious until probably year three. And that's when I started taking some of the money that I was bringing in from Oakmond and the pieces I was building and kind of reinvesting back into it. My uh, first clientele basis was really um, one-off pieces. And I actually worked with a couple uh, wedding planners who their client, uh, which would be the bride and groom, were looking for certain one-off pieces that they could only find on, let's say, Pinterest or Google, or maybe even a magazine. It wasn't really the top-notch or like masterpiece work that I was wanting to get into, but I think it took years to get to that point. So it kind of all dominoed um, in a way that I didn't know was gonna happen, but I'm glad it happened that way. Uh, when I was going through school, I was uh, very fortunate and lucky enough to have my parents support me and they let me work out of the barn, but they give me, they uh, at first only gave me like a 10 by 10 section and then it quickly turned into 20 by 20 and then 30 by, and then I got bigger and bigger until eventually I was taking over half the barn that wasn't really mine. So as we were going through school, we discussed uh, building a more permanent shop, uh, which is what you see behind me here. And this is now where I work out of and it does have uh, heat for the winter because there was a couple winters I was over there where the glue would actually freeze and not set up and I'd have to restart a project. And uh, that, that was definitely a battle. My sawmill operation is actually at my house where I do have a pole barn and I uh, plan on converting it into kind of a uh, slab barn is what I'm going to call it, where my potential clients could come and look and actually select lumber. I've kind of developed a quoting process and also a design process. It, it's, it's very extensive and it's a lot of work up front but uh, I'm under the impression always I've been taught, you know, do things right the first time. So I like to spend a lot of time up front designing, um, getting all the things that I need from the client, all the, when I say things, I mean the information, the size, dimension, and then we can work through it together. And even if we have to go back and forth a couple of times um, on the iterations, that's where I let my CAD training come in and I can build this piece of furniture in a three-dimensional program. And then I'm able to show the client a actual 3D rendering of it. So they have an idea of what this thing's going to look like. And it makes the build go a lot smoother. And it's just a better transaction for the client and myself. Just overall, as a business owner, if, if, you're, if you're not doing the CAD, then I, I think you're going to be steps behind. And I'd, I'd always, uh, always encourage guys like me or someone that's just kind of getting into it to learn a CAD program because it's very, very beneficial. So I purchased the 130 Max. And at the time, that was the biggest one out. And I knew that I was going to be doing a lot of slab work and I didn't want to buy a smaller 
unit and then realized I wish I would have made the step up. So I think I actually saved for a couple more months um, before I purchased just to make sure that I could get the widest mill um, possible. The lumber that I milled from last year is starting to get down and ready to be kiln dried. So I haven't yet dried anything. I'm still actually working on building a kiln, but the whole thought process about a year ago was if I start milling lumber now, I can see some ROI in about a year and start saving some money down the road. Um, lumber prices went up, as everyone knows, that's in the industry. So when that hit, it kind of um, slingshotted me into wanting to get the sawmill and start the kiln build. It's already kind of paid for itself. I haven't seen any actual ROI on the lumber that I've milled a year ago because I still haven't got it dried. But I've actually done a couple um, milling jobs for guys down the street or someone who was kind of driving by and saw the sawmill and the logs in my yard. And they said, hey, would you be able to mill for me? So that wasn't even an uh, uh, avenue I was really wanting to do or even expecting to do, but it just happened. And I said, you know what, that'll be some good money to make back on it while the lumber is still air drying that I've cut and I haven't seen any return on that. So I've already done two or three jobs and have another one right now um, on the books. And then another um, opportunity I think is gonna be selling lumber to other guys like me as well who might not have a kiln yet or might not have a mill. I quickly started realizing, well, maybe the lumber that I don't use, maybe if I have a surplus of that lumber, uh, I could also sell back and I could make money through that route. It, it's, it just makes sense as a furniture builder. And even if you're just doing it for your personal self, I, I think that it would be extremely beneficial and you will definitely see a return. There's been opportunity already without me even really reaching out or doing any marketing for sawing logs for other people, which I was eventually after I got kind of caught up and got my kiln built, I was going to start reaching out and doing some of my marketing on my uh, social media to see if that could be another avenue. And that avenue had already opened itself. So it, as much as I hate to say, I didn't really have to do anything to turn it into a business on that end. It kind of just turned itself into a business. Uh, I've, I've had quite a few people ask me not only to cut the lumber, but to also dry it. So once again, going back to having a kiln, but that's all kind of uh, its own its own environment. If you have the sawmill, usually you have a kiln and it just kind of all snowballs. So I guess my my biggest piece of advice, if, if you get into sawing or I guess building furniture, anything in this realm, do it for the right reasons and do it because you love it. I, I wouldn't go into it with just, I'm here and hungry to make money. Um, I, I like the idea of being like, I can repurpose this tree and that's kind of where I'm at. If I drive by a house and I see a tree that has fallen. A lot of the times they want it out of their yard anyways, and then I get some use out of it. So it helps them, it helps me, but I still haven't purchased a tree or cut down a live tree. It's just getting recycled and put back into um, being, I guess, giving the tree a second life and giving it um, a chance to be something beautiful again. It makes me happy and it, it's kind of, I guess tacky to say this or kind of silly to say it, but seeing that tree on the ground and you see um, like another storm crew down the road and they're just chopping up trees and throwing and making a bunch of noise and chipping it up. And I'm like, oh my God, all these beautiful trees. I wish I had more of myself to salvage more of these trees and uh, be able to use them to turn them into beautiful pieces for my customers.